Good morning, everyone, and good afternoon, depending on where you're virtually connecting in from. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Catherine Austin, and I'm the Marketing Director at iTech, and I'll be moderating this webinar this morning. As two technology companies, iTech and Lee Marine can't meet people face to face right now, like many in the industry due to the coronavirus epidemic. As such, we're evolving um, and we've taken to the virtual world uh, to bring you our conference presentations. So today, our first virtual offering uh, will offer um, people in the industry uh, insight into the topic of enhancing vessel efficiency from iTech and Lee Marine. We have two expert speakers who will each make a 20 minute presentation after which there'll be a 10 minute Q&A session per speaker. So if you have any questions for our speakers, please type them into the Q&A box in your control panel at any time during the presentations. All questions submitted will be anonymous. Um, and also, as we have quite a short uh, time on today's webinar, if we don't manage to put your question to the speaker, please post it into the short feedback questionnaire form that's going to pop up when you exit the webinar and we'll get back to you with an answer from our experts. So without further ado, let's kick off our speaker presentations. Our first speaker will be Mikhail Lorin, CEO of Lean Marine. Mikhail joined Lean Marine as their CEO in 2018. Prior to that, he was the CEO of the Lorin Maritime Group of Companies. Lauren Maritime was an established operator of modern chemical and oil tankers with a fleet of 16, 45 to 50,000 deadweight ton ships. He also has vast experience as a management and strategy consultant. So following that short introduction, I'll hand you over to the man himself. Welcome, Mikhail. Thank you very much, Catherine, for that introduction. And welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm so glad you could all join us. Uh, I'm so sad, on the other hand, that I'm not able to see you and uh, meet you in person because that gives more of a connection. But I think this is a very good medium for what we have today. Uh, we are, due to the corona pandemic, working still in Sweden from the offices. But I just want to assure you, we are observing social distancing. I do have my sweet raspberry scented alcohol gel here and have washed my hands before starting. So let's get to it. The topic for the day is how much fuel saving could your vessel get through operational excellence? And that is a fairly big topic, but I'll try to break it down and it's going to be working with the highlights and of course with the solutions provided by Lean Marine. So who are Lean Marine? Well, we consider ourselves to be maritime experts with a passion for innovation and urge for making a difference. We really want to help our customers and the shipping industry to become operationally more efficient and, importantly, reduce, um, reduce emissions from the vessel and make, it more, make operations more sustainable. What we have achieved so far is that we have 175 systems out on the vessels. We have 40 different customers and we calculate that together we save about 162 million kilos of CO2 per year, which is a fairly substantial amount. But enough about Lean Marine as a company and let's get into ship operation. So we usually talk about ship operation in three stages, uh, which are the planning phase, i.e. everything that happens before the trip to make sure you get the best trip, the execution phase, i.e. taking the ship from port A to port B, and the post-voyage ship, doing uh, reporting based on the trip, looking at analyzing the trip, and basically measuring what happened and learning from that. So if we do jump into the first step, uh, let's see, so the slides join me, there we go, the planning phase. We believe this is a very important part of the voyage due to the simple fact that here you can set up 
the voyage to be as optimized as possible. You can basically build the perfect voyage, assuming that you have the perfect information for the voyage, of course. Today, there are very uh, complex and advanced systems for doing your route planning that takes currents, weather, uh, traffic separation systems, shallow water effects, and so on into account. And we believe using those will help you save quite substantial amounts of fuel. So that is one thing where we really uh, think there's a lot to be earned. Also, part of that is doing your speed optimization, making sure you set the right speed for the voyage. And that is one aspect that I'm going to talk a little bit about in a second, where there's a lot to save. Then there are other aspects as well. When you plan your voyage, you might want to make sure you have your optimized trim. You want to look at uh, things like cargo heating and cooling procedures. Uh, and so on. So just to have a quick look on the planning phase, how much can you save if you do things right? And I'm taking an example from the Lauren Maritime time uh, where we built an algorithm looking at the voyage and just looking at the speed. What do we earn on this voyage? What's the bunker cost? What's the route? How long is the voyage? Are there any problems or any uh, time restrictions we need to meet. And what we realized after building a fairly simple algorithm, taking these uh, factors into account and setting the optimal speed with a little bit of a margin to make sure we're rather under consuming than over consuming is that we saved about a thousand dollars per day. Uh, and that is fairly substantial money, of course. And I believe a lot of companies are looking into slow steaming and have been for some time but I urge you to have a look at how you do it because there is ways to keep optimizing it. And of course, ways to make sure that the optimal speed that you calculated is followed as well. Moving on to the execution phase, i.e. what the bridge team or the ship does to take the ship from port A to port B once she's loaded and ready to go. And there, of course, we have the navigation, we have the optimized speed, coming back to that of following the speed, you can optimize propulsion. Of course, you have all the physical aspects of the vessel as well, uh, but they're not operative, like whether you have hull fouling and so on. And one important thing during the execution phase is that even if you plan the perfect voyage on paper, things will change. Weather is changing, sea states are changing, uh, there might be other factors that are changing your perfect voyage. So it is extremely important to have people on board and systems that can adapt to those changing conditions. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about FuelOpt, which is a system built by Lean Marine that we install on vessels, retrofits or new buildings. And what the system does basically is that it adds controls for the bridge team. Uh, today, if you want to control your engine and speed on most cargo vessels out there, you have a lever and that lever will control RPM. You set the RPM and then you get a speed. Uh, the effect of that is that you're actually controlling usually not what you want to control. You might want to control speed, you might want to control consumption, you might want to control something else, but you're doing that indirectly through setting the RPM. Uh, fuel up is a system that gives you better tools to control your engine and propeller as it is. So, I'm going to do a couple of business cases and present them to you. One important thing talking about ship speed is that the faster you go, the more expensive it gets, and it gets more expensive fast. It's a cubic relationship between speed and consumption usually. Uh, and if we look at how it works, the graph you have here very, very simply shows that if you increase speed, you will increase consumption by more than the speed i.e. if you do a voyage where you do 11 knots half of the voyage, 30 knots half of the voyage, you'll have an average speed of 12 knots. But that will be much less fuel efficient than a voyage with a uh, steady speed of 12 knots. That is, of course, assuming weather is not changing along the way, but just as an example. So it is important to note that speed, the lower speed, the speed you can keep, the more money there is to save. 
And of course, speed is one thing because again, that changes based on, uh, on weather. So what you're really going for is steady and predictable shaft power, i.e. having the engine have a steady output throughout the voyage. So case study one, it's a bulk carrier, 200,000 tonner, fairly small engine for the size in worldwide trade. And we're gonna look at case with the normal uh, RPM lever in uh, place and one with the fuel op system active. So this is five days in operation. And what we see here is that they're running on the RPM lever. So RPM is steady all along. The blue line is, is steady throughout the five days. They seem to be running into some bad weather though, because the speed through water is going down at the end of the voyage. And at the same time, you can see that the brown line, which is the consumption, is going up when the weather gets adverse. So basically in worse weather, you start consuming more, you're still losing power uh, because you're running it this way. Moving on and looking at how will that look if you instead had a fixed shaft power. So in this graph, you can see that shaft power and more or less consumption as well, because they're very, very uh, closely linked they stay constant throughout the five day window. You still have the adverse weather. So you do have a speed variation where the speed drops a bit. The engine moves a little bit as well. But the important thing is that if you compare the two, you will actually have less variation and thus control fuel consumption. And in this case, lower fuel consumption as well. And you're not really losing much speed doing it. In this case, uh, the case study shows that there was an annual fuel saving for these ships of 225 tons per year, which is a fairly substantial amount of money, even today when the oil prices are suddenly much lower. So next thing that fuel up does. So this it gives you the tool to work on shaft power. You can set consumption. But another thing is if you have a controllable pitch propeller, you have another tool built in. And the thing is, uh, usually if you have a controllable pitch propeller, you have a curve controlling which RPM uh, um, equals, there's a curve saying this RPM equals this pitch. And that is uh, basically set. And it's set with margins to account for bad weather, foul hull, engine issues, or an older engine. So there's a lot of margins in there that are not always used. And of course, a pitch propeller is most efficient usually when it's at the max, at 100% pitch. Then it's hydrodynamically pushing the most water rearwards and thus giving the most speed forwards uh, based on the engine power. So if you're not running full steam ahead, 100% pitch, most likely your controllable pitch propeller will not be acting at full at peak performance or optimized performance. So looking at the next case study, this is a MR tanker with a controllable pitch propeller. And if we have a look at what happened to this one, you can see two graphs. Sorry about the graphs, unless you like graphs. I'm a big fan myself. But here you can see the top blue, light blue graph is the speed and how that varies over time, but it varies around a medium of about 11.75 knots. So it's fairly, fairly set along the way. If you look at the lower graph, you have the consumption. And here you can see a very, very strong drop in consumption at one point. And that point is actually where the fuel op system was turned on. So what the fuel op system does to create this consumption savings reduce consumption is that it looks at the engine parameters. So it takes in all the engine parameters. It ha has all the limitations of the engine. So it can't do anything it's not allowed to do with the engine. But it also looks at the engine parameters, how the engine is doing and the pitch. And it basically aims to optimize the pitch based on the settings from the bridge. And whether that is shaft power or speed doesn't really matter. It try tries to optimize for that. So for this ship, you have the gray lines 
uh, columns, which were the before state. And then with the system on, you can see that the engine RPM goes down and the propeller pitch goes up, i.e. you get more power from a lower speed, from an engine running at lower speed, and you're reducing your consumption. In this case, the savings were actually three tons per day, which is pretty substantial. And the annual savings were over 600 tons for this vessel. Moving on to the post-voyage phase. We have, once you've done the voyage, you're in port, you need to do a bit of reporting. We have another product called Fleet Analytics. And Fleet Analytics takes all the signals that the fuel op system collects. It needs to collect a lot of signals to make the algorithm and control speed, propeller pitch, and so on. All of those signals and whatever signals more we want to take in are sent to a cloud-based system, which has an interface which basically is a reporting, analytics, and performance management interface. So we can do all of that. And it's extremely important in my mind to learn from what you've done, to be able to measure and get forward. And my experience when it comes to measurement is a lot from the time at Lori Maritime, where we realized that if you can measure it, you can manage it. How we realized that was that we did a lot of things on the vessel. We installed a lot of equipment, we changed processes uh, and so on, and changed how we, how we did operations. But even though we did all of those things, we could see reduced consumption, but we, it was very difficult to figure out what did what. Because if you look, and this is just a standard list of fuel saving measures that you can do, you can see that some of them give an immediate large effect, but most of them give an effect in the one to 10% region. And unless you have a good way to measure, it's really difficult to, uh, to see those changes, especially if you do several things at one time. So again, we realized we had a typical measurement error of five to 10%. Usually the speed log alone was five to 10% error. So you need a system to be able to see what you're doing and learn from what you're doing, i.e. you need to be able to measure it to manage it. Standard for shipping for many years has been a noon report, which is manually, uh, you have manually gorged tanks, you're reading the meters on board, you're typing your noon report, you're sending it off, i.e. the data is manually collected usually. Uh, it's very infrequent uh, in today's uh, terminology anyhow, and it's prone to have errors. Even if the measurement is perfect, it might have been done 15 minutes before the report was sent and so on. So there are a lot of measurements that are in that. So what I believe you need to be able to get proper measurements is automated data coming in. And then you enable analysis and you enable the uh, basis for learning from what you've done. Here, one important thing to say as well is that having data is not enough. You can have all the data in the world and not be one bit happier for it. You need to be able to make the data useful. So it's important to have an interface or a filter on the data so you can turn the data into knowledge. And that is one very important thing when you're working with this. Another thing that we're seeing a lot about right now, we're seeing a lot of right now, is AI systems, machine learning, deep learning systems. And in order for them to do, be able to do any good, they need vast amounts of data because they need to draw conclusions on their own, more or less, even though you assist them a bit. So in order for any of those type of solutions to work, you need quite a lot of data and you need to decide what you want out of that data. Fleet Analytics has fleet overview, voyage reporting, analysis functions. So I will not go through them in detail, but just to say that there are good tools for the operations department where you can get a good overview of what the ships are doing, where they are. You can get your reports done. It's a lot of reports in the system where you can get fuel reports, you can get MRV reports, you can get voyage reports, and so on. And we're trying to build it as simple as possible. So it's easy to use and easy to get the results you want. And of course, we have, because that's basically where we started, we have a fairly uh, big analysis section in the system as well. You can compare ships, you can compare voyages, 
and you can see how the ship is performing over time. So back to this slide that I showed earlier on. And now I've added a couple of arrows on it. And that is, of course, because the post-voyage work, the reporting you need to do most likely, but if you can utilize that and bring that back into the planning phase, that's when you gain a lot of knowledge and can perfect the next voyage. Even if it might be a different uh, technical voyage, at least you're learning and you can improve over time. Another important factor here is that with systems, uh, AI systems and so on that tend, that want to take more control of the vessel, you will need a way, a way for the system to communicate with the ship. And fuel op can take external signals. So if you have an AI system telling the ship what speed to do, that will give you, uh, you that will be a, enable you to implement that speed exactly. Even if you don't have that, with a fuel op system, you can see what's happening on the ship, and also you can give the ship an order on set speed and make sure that is followed easily because you don't have to control it via RPM. It's controlled directly on consumption, speed, or shaft power. Another thing I want to mention when we talk about that is, I'll skip back one, is if you have any sort of wind-assisted uh, systems on the ship, or different types of propulsion or energy sources, it's very good to have a system that can balance those. We see uh, wind system being systems or wind assisted propulsion being installed on ships that doesn't necessarily have the system to take care of the wind. When the wind is blowing, you use your propulsion, you get more speed, but you might want to have less consumption instead. Fuel up is a system that automatically can help you balance that and you can set your speed. If the wind is blowing, you'll use your engine less instead of your skating speed. So that is one area where we are very positive that fuel up can be part of any wind-assisted uh, solutions for vessels. Okay, so if you can measure it, you can manage it, right? So now how do you manage it? And you might think that I've told you already, but I want to mention one more thing before I end, and that is in order to get any of this to work properly, my experience is you don't just need the tools. You need to change the company culture. You need to educate the people using the system and hopefully the people not using the system so they understand what's happening as well. You need to show the results so everybody understands that what I'm doing is making a difference. A brief example that we did is we had a performance management system installed on a vessel with the manuals, everything, so all the information was there. And for various reason, reasons, the ship was left to sail for three months without any additional education. And nothing happened on fuel consumption. Then we got our environmental manager on board to do a one-week education and immediately saw almost 10%, well, 9.4% fuel reduction on the vessel. Because having the tool is not enough. Understanding it and understanding how to use it and wanting to use it makes a huge difference. So in short, I believe it's important to change the culture. I think there are many ways operative where you can get fairly quick return investment. Again, improving your uh, opt optimized speed for every voyage is one of them. And I think it's important as well because every bit of efficiency helps save fuel, i.e. So helps the planet, it helps saves money, and it usually saves time because you simplify reporting, you simplify that work. So with the call that our planet can't wait and save fuel and lower CO2 emissions. That is it from me. Thank you very much for listening. Great, thank you, Mikhail. Um, so now we'll take a few questions. We've had quite a few coming in. Um, a quick reminder um, to put your questions to Mikhail into the Q&A section of the control panel if you haven't done so already. Um, and if we don't cover it, then please post them to us in the, the questionnaire after the webinar. Um, so the first question, Mikhail, um, is to what extent are vessels already optimized for speed? Um, and, and the uh, person asked, would 20 to 30 percent fuel savings still be possible, given that many vessels have been slow steaming for many years? 
It depends on the vessel. Sorry to give that political answer, but it depends a lot. If you're slow steaming, you might have done a lot of it already. But as I mentioned earlier, I believe there are you for most for many companies. Uh, if you're listening, you're probably interested in this, so you've probably done a lot already. But for many companies, there are ways to tweak the algorithm or how you calculate your optimal speed that will actually improve your results or your emission savings. And also, an important thing, if you have a controllable pitch propeller, there are definitely ways to improve, and those are there more if you're slow steaming than if you're going full st speed. So for a controllable pitch propeller ship, if you're not running all of the time full steam ahead, full pitch, then there's definitely savings to be had. Uh, that said, it differs a little bit between ships. Some ships have more aggressive combinator curves, and thus less to say. Some ships have more relaxed combinator curves, to use that word, and thus have uh, less to save. But we haven't seen one ship so far where we haven't seen a substantial saving, uh, and the more active the ship is, the more there is to save. But again, uh, it differs a bit. But yes, there are savings for, still savings to be had, I believe, for every ship we've seen anyhow. Great, thank you. Um, I, I hope that covers your question. Um, the next question, uh, I guess, is maybe more of a practical one. How does fuel opt uh, connect on board to the engine? We usually... Uh, a standard fuel opt installation on uh, an existing ship is usually that we install mass flow meters to get the fuel uh, figures, fuel consumption. We uh, install a shaft torque meter to get the engine output, and then we connect to the uh, to the uh, alarm system basically to get at all the other systems, the Kongsberg system or the Lynxer system. So we get all the other systems that way. That is usually the easiest way because most of the other systems are in that system. And as I mentioned before, we usually connect on the bridge as well to uh, speed log, GPS, anemometer, and other system, other signals in, depending a little bit on what the customer wants. So that's how we do it. Hope that answers your question. Thanks. Um, and then the next question um, is about existing hardware requirements on board. Uh, so the question is. Do I need other data gathering tools um, installed on board in addition to the fuel op system? It depends on how you set up the fuel system. The fuel op system has been built very, we can take in a lot of signals. Uh, we've built it, the database structure in a way so you can basically expand on the number of signals without making it fuel specific because that is something that's been important for us. So do you need other system? It depends. If you want a performance management system, reporting system, analysis system, fuel up plus fleet analytics can do all that and take in all the signals you want. But of course, it's not taking in any commercial si uh, signals. Uh, we don't, we uh, sometimes connect to the cargo system, but not always. So it depends a little bit on how you're set up. But looking at performance management from a propulsion and voyage reporting uh, perspective, I believe you can get uh, all of that done through FuelOpt and Fleet Analytics. Great. And uh, so this uh, will unfortunately be the last question, um, Mikhail, but um, mm -hmm. in the case that some data isn't automatically uh, gathered, um, is FuelOpt a hybrid system where manual data can also be entered uh, by the crew in supplemental uh, noon messages? Uh, thank you, very good question, yes. In fleet analytics, some signals are not entered automatically, like start and end of a voyage is usually not collected automatically, so that might be need to be manually input. There are also ways to confirm figures. You might have an issue with a meter on board and then might need to put in the actual figure. So all figures that go into the system go in automatically, but if you see that something is wrong, you can always go into the system through the fleet analytics interface and change the figures. Uh, usually there are some discrepancies on bunkers, etc. usually small. Uh, so that is one point where you might need to confirm or need to change the figures as you go along. 
And that is something where we believe as well that any system today, considering going back to the previous questions, what systems do you need? Well, you're going to need a lot of systems for different things. But if you have a social system that can talk to other systems via a standardized set interface, you are going to start saving more and more time on reporting and entering data. And we are trying very hard, and I believe we've come fairly far, in building a system with an easy interface in and out. Great, thank you so much. Um, it looks like uh, we've covered as many questions as we possibly can uh, for Mikhail. Um, and so, Mikhail, is there anything else uh, you want to cover or wrap up uh, before we move on to the next presentation? Uh, no, not really. Just feel free to send me an email if you have more questions. Unless you already posted them, then we'll try to take care of them after the seminar. And otherwise, I just want to thank you for taking the time to uh, listen to me and Marcus. Thank you. Perfect, thanks. Okay, so uh, next, I would like to introduce our second presenter, uh, Dr. Marcus Hoffman. Um, who's the technical director at iTech. Marcus has a long history working in the marine coating sector. Uh, prior to working at iTech, he served as the R&D department manager of Hempel's anti-fouling Global Center of Excellence in Barcelona. He also previously held the post of team manager central R&D at BASF, and he has a PhD in organic chemistry. Uh, so with that short introduction complete, I'll hand you over to Marcus. Uh, for his presentation on barnacle fouling. Over to you, Marcus. Hello, good morning, good afternoon. Thank you, Catherine, for, for the nice introduction. Um, more or less, um, I will um, keep on where Michael stopped because he, when he talked about uh, measures to take to improve uh, performance of a vessel, um, one of the top three um, points was the hull. And uh, today I will talk a little bit about uh, the barnacle fouling problem when uh, the underwater hull of, a, of the vessel gets fouled with barnacles. So, so who's iTech? Um, we are a small global biotech company, uh, a blue biotech uh, based in Sweden. And uh, we are the inventor of an uh, active uh, ingredient, a biocide, which is called Selectope which we sell then to the global paint manufacturers. Uh, those are our customers and they then deliver it to all um, ship owners. We are uh, stock market listed. We are now two years on uh, Nasdaq North in, uh, in, in Sweden. Um, and there are more than 400 vessels already uh, protected with, with our technology. So I will focus on biofouling today. And uh, why uh, is there so much focus on biofouling lately? Um, barnacle, or fouling generally, and barnacle uh, especially, they can increase up to 50% uh, the drag of, of your vessel when, uh, when the hull gets fouled. Um, and that has, a, has huge impacts. So the first of all, um, if you reduce uh, the drag, if you reduce the fouling, um, you reduce the fuel bill and, of course, the carbon dioxide emissions. So there, there are some estimates uh, that uh, reduction of up to 10%, which is, is, is reasonable, changing uh, the, the hull protection uh, can save up to 10 to 15 billion US dollars for the, for the global shipping company. Um, the second point uh, is carbon dioxide, of course, but it's not only carbon dioxide, but also uh, sulfur, uh, SOx, uh, NOx, and, and small particles which also have to be reduced. Um, and the third part is there's much more focus in the last years on invasive species. So uh, probably all of you know that uh, there has been the implementation of the water ballast treatment uh, in the last years, but it seems that uh, the invasive species do not travel so much in the water ballast tanks, but uh, in the niche areas where I will later on show you some, uh, some slides. So how bad is barnacle really for, for the fouling? There is a lot of studies and history around, and uh, I talked before about the 10% fuel savings are reasonable if uh, all vessels globally would, would go to better hull protection systems, which would be similar to up to 100 million tons of carbon dioxide, which is more than a country like, like Sweden in it. So if you look on, on the right, there is a, a study, I just took one study, which is uh, the one which most people cite in the industry, 
from uh, the Office of Naval Research uh, in, in the US. This was done on, on, on a Navy vessel and a frigate. Uh, of course, it depends on every vessel. Uh, going at uh, 15 knots, um, on the bottom you can see, depending on the fouling, um, there is uh, a small fouling, hard fouling has 34% of increase of, of drag, medium hard fouling, uh, medium sized barnacles, and if it's heavily fouled, up to 80% increase of, 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 of drag for, for any vessel. Uh, of course, this depends on the speed you go and on the vessel type and uh, on, on the. But there's a huge impact on uh, on the fouling. Also, um, algae and and, and the slime also have already an effect of up to 10% of of drag. So, what's Selectope and and, and uh, what does it do? So, this is a, a picture of a, of a vessel which was sailing in, in, in Tokyo Bay, which is a very hot spot for for very aggressive waters where you find a lot of barnacles. And you can see um, there's this yellow um, box. This is a, a test patch where a uh, selectope containing paint was applied, which is free of barnacles, and uh, the rest of the hull where uh, traditional uh, anti fouling was, was applied. You can see heavy fouling of, of, of barnacles. So, what's the biotech approach uh, that, that, that ITEC went to more than 20, 20 years ago? On the left, you can see how a uh, barnacle larvae looks before she settles. On the left, you can see here there are the legs which uh, the barnacle uses to swim around. In the middle, you can see the structure of, uh, of uh, selectope, which is an organic uh, molecule. And what it does, it, it binds to a, uh, to a receptor, which is more like a switch. So when it binds to the receptor, which is called octopamine receptor, um, it turns off some, uh, some mechanism inside of the barnacle, which means uh, it swims much faster. So the legs, which, which, I've, uh, which I've marked on the left, they uh, have a much higher frequency of, 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 of triggering and uh, they swim much faster. Selectope um, went through all uh, approvals in the European Union and, and, and the main uh, countries. So it has been approved and can be, can be applied. One, thing that uh, I would like to, to mention also is uh, that there's no bioaccumulation in the organism. So it's absorbed by the, by, by the barnacle, uh, it starts swimming faster, and after several hours it's digested, and there is no bioaccumulation in, 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 in any organism. So what's, what's the working mechanism? You see here there's the adult barnacle, um, and they release uh, larvae to, to grow and to proliferate. So the first step is uh, they, they release the nautilus larvae. They swim around and, uh, and grow and, and, and eat. And after some time, these nautilus larvae, they convert into a second type of larvae, which is called the cypress larvae. And this, the cypress larvae, this is the one which really wants to settle on, uh, on a hard surface because barnacles only can survive uh, on, on a hard surface. So settling down for them is a question of life and death. And what, as mentioned before, uh, selectope does. So if it wants to settle on a surface where there is selectope around, uh, or, or when it comes in contact with selectope, um, it swims much faster, and, and it's too fast or it's too exaggerated to settle down. So uh, it can't settle down. It's blocked from settling down uh, while it's having this selectope on, on the, attached to the uh, receptor. After two or three hours, uh, it, it's gone and then it can settle on any other surface. So it's not really harmful to the barnacle. It's just uh, it's avoiding them to settle down on, on the vessel hull. So what's also diff what's also uh, in the cell tube, What's different to, to other biocides? So it can be used together with cuprous oxide or uh, without cuprous oxide. Um, this is an example on the right. Um, one biocide, if you have one liter of paint, uh, there can be up to 700 grams of one biocide uh, alternative a, a B, uh, six or 10 grams of an alternative A, and selectope is very uh, active, so you only need a very small amount in the paint, so it is 0.1% 0 .1 of weight in the, in the paint uh, is active, meaning with 1.6 grams per liter of paint, uh, you, you can have a similar effect with, uh, which, uh, with other uh, like other biocides with around 800 uh, grams. Meaning the total amount of biocide can be reduced of up to 95%. So 
So now I will talk a little bit about uh, the barnacle uh, on the global level. Um, this data comes from interking. Uh, we don't have access to these uh, information, so we commissioned uh, a report to Safina Group, which is an expert group on marine coatings, uh, and they do interking reports, and uh, they were able to, to, to deliver us uh, a very interesting report, which I now will uh, present. Um, it's around 250 vessels uh, were analyzed. Um, on these 250 vessels, uh, there were 572 observations of fouling. Um, and this report is based on the last five years, so, so one can say it's the actual, <coughs> sorry, it's the actual paint systems which have been presented and not historical uh, systems which are not in the market anymore. So the percentage of barnacle fouling. So um, on the bottom you see um, the coverage of, of animal fouling on the, on the underwater hull area uh, from zero to 10%. <coughs> Sorry, it's regarded as uh, almost falling free. There's always some mechanical damage or some block marks which are not covered with paint. So the, you always will get some areas which are not fully protected. So up to 10% is uh, can be uh, accepted. So 56% um, of vessels have less than 10% of, of animal falling, um, meaning that 44% of all vessels have more than 10% of the underwater hull area covered with, uh, with barnacles. And a certain amount have between 50, 60, or even 70% of, of all the hull covered with barnacles. By location, so this is just the probability of, uh, of the area which has, uh, where you can find barnacles. So all blue means that you find either animals or wheat. So the boot top, which is the area which is not always immersed, uh, up to 80% you find some um, animal fouling. On the vertical sides, it's also around 80%. Uh, flat bottom, um, also around uh, 85, up to 90. But very interesting, if you go to the sea chests, um, it's more than 95% of the sea chests you find uh, animal fouling, hard fouling which, as mentioned before, is, is, is uh, one of the main vectors for invasive species. And especially countries like uh, New Zealand, uh, Australia, and the state of California have put a much bigger effort and focus on invasive species. So now we talk about the percentage coverage uh, depending on, on, on location. So if you look on, on the boot top, 88% uh, 86% of uh, the boot top has less than 10% of animal fouling. But meaning that still 14% have more than 10% uh, of the area fouled, which is somehow surprising because the boot top spends quite some time out of water, so you would expect that uh, there, there should be no hard fouling at all. On the underwater, on, on the vertical sides, only 67% of the underwater hull areas have less than 10% uh, of, of hard fouling and 33% have more than 10% uh, hard falling, mainly barnacles. And then if you go to the flat bottom, uh, only 54% uh, of the so flat bottom, only 54% of, of, uh, of the area is less than 10% fouled, which having in consideration that there are the block marks, which when you dock a vessel, uh, that's the area which is not painted at all, um, is still uh, surprising. If you compare high activity versus low activity, uh, Michael talked a lot about uh, slow steaming. There's generally a tendency that the faster you go, the less fouling uh, you have. And also uh, the more activity, the less idle a vessel is, um, the less probably uh, it is that you get fouling because fouling, hard fouling especially happens when a vessel is, is laying up. So if you talk on a low activity vessels, 50 or 55% of the vessels have less than 10% of, of, of the uh, surface fault. And if you go to high activity um, vessels, 73% of the vessels uh, have less than 10% of the underwater hull area fault. But of course, nowadays with the uncertainty which is ongoing, you, it's very difficult to predict where you have to lay up. So um, if you can get an extra insurance to, to protect against barnacle, that will give you more flexibility. If you look into different grade of anti-foulings, um, the blue one is, is the high grade, uh, top quality. 
the orange is the medium grade and the, and the gray is the low grade. Uh, you can see that if you go on the um, top grade, it's around 10, 12% of the area is, is covered with uh, barnacles and hard fouling, which is still surprising uh, that even the, the top products still have up to 10, 12% of the area covered with, with barnacles. Then you see a significant increase, uh, almost 40, 35, 37% um, uh, of the hull is covered with hard fouling if you go to medium grade. And surprisingly, you see a little bit less on the low grade, the gray area, which is uh, about 30%. And that's an explanation because uh, if you have uh, low fouling water, low fouling trade, and uh, no money, you go for uh, low grade. But if you have five years and aggressive waters, uh, a lot of shipping companies go for the medium grade, which do not want to invest the money for, for, for high grade. But it's, it's a clear, uh, it shows clearly that more expensive and uh, better systems definitely protect you better against uh, hard fouling. And, yeah. So now um, we will get some, some case studies. So there are a lot of factors which influence uh, uh, the fouling. It depends, as I talked before, the ND fouling uh, type, uh, the biosets which are used in the ND fouling, um, the activity of the vessels, the trading patterns, uh, the layup, where it's laid up. So a lot of factors influence uh, the fouling. And we go through some examples. This is a low grade anti fouling. Uh, it's a bulker. And uh, you can find here on the FB with flat bottom, it's roughly 50% of the uh, flat bottom is covered with barnacles. And on the vertical side, it's also uh, roughly even more than 50% is covered with, with barnacles with of, of quite extensive size. And this has a huge impact on, on workmanship consumption. The same can happen to medium grade. In this case, it's a, it's a classic land fouling. Um, the biocides copper, copper peritone, and silip. So there's normally one biocide against hard fouling, uh, animals and barnacles, and another one against algae and slime. So this is an LNG after five years of trading. Um, it's roughly on, on the flat bottom. It's a third of the area, which is a little bit uh, more than a third, which is covered with barnacles. And on the vertical sides, it's also a little bit less than, than a third. And you can see that, that the size um, of the barnacles can, can be quite significant. They can get very big, several centimeters of size. Even, but even high-grade anti-foulings uh, can get fouled, depending on, on the trade and, and uh, the local circumstances. So in this case, it's an oil product tanker. Um, Again, it's roughly about 50% of the boot top end of the vertical sides have barnacle fouling uh, of, of yeah, several centimeters size. Um, so, so far, I showed you mainly classical anti foulings, but there's another coating technology. It's, it's called fouling release or silicone. Um, in this vessel, it was on the vertical sides uh, silicone on the flat bottom uh, anti fouling. Um, and there's also um, on the vertical sides roughly a Third of the of, of, of the hull is covered with uh, with uh, barnacles. So it's not only uh, classic and fouling; all type of, of fouling systems can foul. This is an example uh, with some pictures provided by by Jukoku, one of the paint manufacturers uh, we work with. Um, on the left, you can see some gradings um, of, of an LPG carrier, uh, which is 15 months uh, trading in Japan. And you can see that the gradings uh, are barnacle uh, covered, and they have developed a, a product, a paint containing selectope against uh, for the protection of, of niche areas, uh, niche areas and, uh, and, and gradings. And on the right, you can see that they, they use um, they use a product containing copper and selectope to prevent the fouling of uh, of, of, um, of the gradings. And there are several impacts. First of all, you avoid uh, the, uh, the, the transfer of invasive species. And secondly, also you need less uh, energy to pump uh, the, the water. Uh, another case story, this is an M NMR tanker, about uh, around 50 months now uh, of trading. On the left, you can see the trading pattern. So it was trading in the Caribbean uh, and the Atlantic, but also in Southeast Asia. And on the right, uh, you can see uh, the dots showing where she was idling. And there were quite some idling in the Caribbean. There was some idling in, in Southeast Asia uh, with very aggressive waters and up to 40 or more than 40 days of, of idling. And uh, here you can see, uh, <coughs> sorry, 
Here you can see an, uh, an performance analysis showing on the bottom uh, the time, the date, and on the left, on, on, on the y-axis, you can see the added resistance. There was a docking uh, in 2016 when she got a paint containing selectope, uh, a top uh, performing product. Uh, she was full blasted and there was a propeller cleaning after some time. And then overall, after now almost four and a half years, it's around 15% of increased uh, um, resistance. Before, if you compare it, uh, the vessel was cleaned here. Um, and after the clean, probably all any fighting was gone and, and the performance uh, um, got worse extremely after a very short time. So compared to a, a normal system, uh, the vessel is, is, is fouling free. Normally, you believe what you see, so there are some pictures also. Um, you can see after 27 months on the top, 32 months in the, in the middle and 36 months at the bottom, you can see some algae on uh, on the draft marks where it's not coated with an anti fouling. On the in the middle on the left, you can see here that there is some foul, you see some uh, some fouling on the on the flat bottom, which comes from a block mark. When a vessel docks, it sits on some wooden blocks where there is uh, where the, it's not coated, and so you can see she was going into hard uh, fouling areas, um, and where it's not protected with this coating, uh, it, it gets fouled. Yeah, as a summary, um, I, I can, uh, there is barnacle fouling is a huge issue for, uh, for, for vessels and it easily can improve uh, performance if you choose a top performing product uh, up to 10%. Um, and for the invasive species, this is one way forward in the future that you can protect your niche areas and, uh, and, and the hull from transferring barnacles and other stuff. So thank you very much for your time and I'm looking very much forward to answering any questions. Perfect, thank you, Marcus. Um, okay, so now it's time for questions. Um, we've had a lot coming in. Um, and so the first question uh, for you, Marcus, is, uh, is, is Selectope applied as a separate coating or is it included in the primary paint application? So, so it's included in the anti-fouling. So um, we deliver, so we are supplier to paint companies. They formulate the paints and it's, a no, it's, it's applied as a normal anti-fouling uh, um, as one of the biocides. So there's no extra work. It's just choosing the, the an anti-fouling with, uh, with uh, selectope that gives you the protection. So it's no extra work. It's just, uh, just uh, choosing the product or, or yeah, first around with uh, anti-foulings with, uh, with selectope. Um, and I guess this, this next question uh, leads on quite nicely from that is, are there any low grade anti-fouling products that contain Selectope or is it just uh, premium products that contain uh, the technology? So most of the products out at the moment are um, premium. There are some medium, uh, medium tier products also. Um, it's very difficult. It's, it's, I have to admit, it's not a cheap product, so so it's difficult to to deliver a low grade, uh, a lo a low tier anti fouling. Um, a lot of products which also used is for new building, uh, when you have uh, eight ten months of outfitting, that gives you protection for uh, for the outfitting period. Perfect. Um, and then quite a, a quick question, Marcus. Um, which paint makers are using Selectope as an ingredient in their products right now? Yeah. So um, we are working with a lot of paint makers. Um, the companies which have it um, already in their portfolio, um, I can mention it's Hampel, Chukoku, and Jotun. Um, if you go on our web page, you can find a list with all available uh, products so far. Perfect. Um, and can Selectope alone manage all hard fouling prevention? No. So um, maybe I wasn't clear on that. Uh, Selectope is very specific on barnacles, um, on all type of barnacles. It has also some activity against uh, tube worms, um, but it has no activity against uh, algae or slime. So you always will need a second, uh, a second biocide, at least for the algae and slime. Perfect. Um, and uh, the question is, you mentioned that uh, Selectope is used in biocidal coatings right now, um, but can Selectope theoretically be used in foul release coatings? 
uh, technically it can be used. Um, this is some type of, it's not some type of philosophical question. Um, a lot of people want to have a biocide free system, um, but it technically can be used in, in, uh, in the silicon system to give you some extra protection. So for example, if you have a scratch or if it's uh, very often the silicon systems start uh, protecting, um, but, but it can be used and it gives you an extra, uh, extra layer of protection. Perfect. Um, and then a question about um, ship areas. So can uh, selecto coatings um, be used in box coolers, propellers, rudders, um, especially for coated box coolers, which are pr prone to serious fouling? Yeah, uh, te technically it can be done. Uh, so as, as mentioned, so we are a supplier to paint companies. Uh, so we do some testing on, on some of the mentioned areas uh, ourselves. Um, and, and we show the results to some paint companies and uh, it's them, it's up to them then to, to, to offer the product, but technically it can be done. Um, yeah. And you mentioned uh, the niche area barnacle fouling problem is huge. Uh, ca how can coatings be tailored uh, for other parts of the hull, um, such as niche areas and why are these uh, area is so problematic compared to uh, the vertical sides or flat bottom? Yeah. Uh, different different uh, reasons. So first of all, the, the paints can be optimized for, for each area of the hull. Normally you don't need on, on the boot top, you don't need uh, the same quality as you need on the flat bottom or on the vertical sides. Also, you, you, you could, can use on the flat bottom where there's less light and you don't have algae, you also can use a different paint system. Or you, um, normally on the flat bottom you have um, barnacles and cube worms, so, so that, that could be optimized. For the niche areas, uh, there are different explanations why, why, why it's so heavily fouled. Uh, one is uh, um, if, if, if you go for the thrusters, for example, um, if they're not used, they have not so much water flow very often when they are idling. Um, on the gratings, you have, uh, you have the edge, and very often the, the sharp edge, you have much less paint and much less protection. So the hard falling comes from, from the edge. Um, and that probably will have to change in the future. I, I expect that in the future, the, the design for, for the gratings will be round bars. And the third uh, reason, in my opinion, is so far when uh, niche areas uh, are, are coated, they, they do not get the attention they deserve uh, in, in the shipyard. Um, it's very uh, often coated late and fast. And uh, I've even seen a barnacle being overcoated in, 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 in Niche areas, uh, so that that also will probably have to change. And um, what can be done, of course, uh, and what one paint company has done is, if you add selectobe or if you increase the amount of other biocides, you can give extra protection for for the um, for for the niche areas. Perfect. Thanks, Marcus. And um, just moving to the final question. Um, for a selectope coating application, does the existing coating have to be completely removed um, for a selectope coating to be applied? Um, difficult to answer. Well, generally, no. Um, it's, it depends very much on, on, on the paint maker's formulation. So it's uh, probably uh, you can make a, a easily an anti, a anti fouling containing selectope which can overcoat anything. Um, Generally, I would say there's no need to take off uh, 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 an old anti-fouling, which just can overcoat. Uh, but also, there's always each paint maker has its own list which old system can be overcoated uh, or not. So it's the same as, as always. Uh, you ask your paint maker, um, I have the system, can it be overcoated? Uh, and there's no reason why a selectope containing uh, paint uh, is, 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 is more difficult uh, in overcoating than any other. Great, thank you, Marcus. Um, and so that comes to uh, the end of our Q&A session for Marcus. So thank you very much. Um, and that also brings us to the end of the webinar. Um, so that leaves me to say a big thank you uh, for joining us today. Uh, we hope that you found this webinar interesting and useful. Um, we'd also like to thank the organizers of the Green Ship Technology Conference um, for promoting this webinar. Um, the webinar actually came about uh, from iTech and Lee Marine um, after we uh, uh, were involved in, in the Green Ship Technology earlier this month. 
Um, but unfortunately, it was impacted by the coronavirus pandemic. Um, and that's where the idea came about for presenting our conference sessions virtually. Um, so thank you to them. We've had a lot of questions submitted uh, to our speakers today. So if we didn't uh, cover your question, um, please post it into the feedback form uh, that's going to pop up when you exit this webinar. Um, and we'll make sure that we get back to you um, for, with an answer to your question. Um, also, you should uh, be receiving the PDF versions of the presentations made by Mikhail and Marcus. Um, and one final point from me, Lee Marine and iTech will be hosting more webinars throughout the year, uh, either together or separately. If you opted to be informed about these when you signed up for this webinar, or if you subscribe to Lee Marine's or iTech's regular e-newsletters, then you'll hear from us soon. Uh, so from me, thank you very much uh, for your time. Thank you to Mikhail and Marcus uh, for making your expert presentations today. Uh, stay safe and have a really great day. Thank you so much.